Chapters 4 through 6 of Space Viking by H. Beam Piper. Read by Mark Nelson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Space Viking 4. They halted under the colonnade. Beyond, the lower main terrace was crowded, and a medley of old love songs was wafting from the sound outlets for the sixth or eighth time around. He looked at his watch. It was ninety seconds later than the last time he had done so. Give it fifteen more minutes to get started, and another fifteen to get away after the marriage toasts and the felicitations. And no marriage, however pompous, lasted more than half an hour. An hour, then, till he and Elaine would be in the air-car, bulleting toward Traskin. The love-song stopped abruptly. After a momentary silence, a trumpet, considerably amplified, blared the ducal salute. The crowd stopped shifting, the buzz of voices ceased. At the head of the landing-stage escalators there was a glow of color and the ducal party began moving down. A platoon of guards in red and yellow, with gilded helmets and tasseled halberds, an esquire bearing the sword of state, Duke Angus with his council, Otto Harkeman among them, the Duchess Flavia and her companion ladies, the household gentlemen and their ladies, more guardsmen. There was a great burst of cheering. The new service air cars got into position above the procession. Cousin Nicolay and a few others stepped out from between the pillars and into the sunlight. There was a similar movement at the other end of the terrace. The ducal party reached the end of the central walkway, halted, and deployed. "'All right, let's shove off,' Cousin Nicolay said, stepping forward. Ten minutes since they had come outside, another five to get into position. Fifty minutes now, till he and Elaine— Lady Elaine Trask of Traskin, for real and for always, would be going home. "'Sure the car's ready?' he asked for the hundredth time. His cousin assured him that it was. Figures in Carval black and flame yellow appeared across the terrace. The music began again, this time the stately Noble's Wedding March, arrogant and at the same time tender. Cesar Carval's gentleman secretary and the Carval lawyer, executives of the steel mills, the Carval guard captain, Cesar himself, with Elaine on his arm. She was wearing a shawl of black and yellow. He looked around in sudden fright. "'For the love of Satan, where's our shawl?' he demanded, and then relaxed when one of his gentlemen exhibited it, green and tawny in Traskin colors. The bridesmaids, led by Lady Lavina Carval. Finally they halted, ten yards apart, in front of the Duke. "'Who approaches us?' Duke Angus asked of his guard captain. He had a thin, pointed face, almost femininely sensitive, and a small pointed beard. He was bare-headed, except for the narrow gold circlet which he spent most of his waking time scheming to convert into a royal crown. The guard-captain repeated the question. "'I am Sir Nicolay Trask. I bring my cousin and liege lord, Lucas, Lord Trask, Baron of Traskin. He comes to receive the lady, Demoiselle Elaine, daughter of Lord Caesar Carval, Baron of Carval Mills.' and the sanction of your grace to the marriage between them." Sir Maximon Zorge, Caesar Carval's henchman, named himself and his lord. They brought the lady Demoiselle Elaine to be wed to Lord Trask of Traskin. The duke, satisfied that these were persons whom he could address directly, asked if the terms of the marriage agreement had been reached. Both parties affirmed this. Sir Maximon passed a scroll to the Duke. Duke Angus began to read the stiff and precise legal phraseology. Marriages between noble houses were not matters to be left open to dispute. 
a great deal of spilled blood and burned powder had resulted from ambiguity on some point of succession, or inheritance, or dower rights. Lucas bore it patiently. He didn't want his great-grandchildren and Elaine's shooting it out over a matter of a misplaced comma. "'And these persons here before us do enter into this marriage freely?' the Duke asked, when the reading had ended. He stepped forward as he spoke, and his esquire gave him the two-hand sword of state, heavy enough to behead a bisonoid. Trask stepped forward. Caesar Carball brought Elaine up. The lawyers and henchmen obliqued off to the sides. "'How say you, Lord Trask?' he asked, almost conversationally. "'With all my heart, your grace.' "'And you, Lady Demoiselle Elaine?' "'It is my greatest wish, your grace.' The Duke took the sword by the blade and extended it. They laid their hands on the jeweled pommel. "'And do you and your houses avow us, Angus, Duke of Wardshaven, to be your sovereign prince, and pledge fealty to us and to our legitimate and lawful successors? We do, not only he and Elaine, but all around them, and all the throng in the gardens answered, the spectators in shouts. Very clearly, above it all, somebody, with more enthusiasm than discretion, was bawling, Long live Angus, the first of Graham! And we, Angus, do confer upon you too, and your houses, the right to wear our badge as you see fit, and pledge ourselves to maintain your rights against any and all who may presume to invade them. And we declare that this marriage between you two, and this agreement between your respective houses, does please us, and we avow you two, Lucas and Elaine, to be lawfully wed, and whoso questions this marriage challenges us, in our teeth and to our despite. That wasn't exactly the wording used by a ducal lord on Graham. It was the formula employed by a planetary king, like Napoleon of Flamberge, or Rodolphe of Excalibur. And, now that he thought of it, Angus had consistently used the royal first-person plural. Maybe that fellow who had shouted about Angus the First of Graham had only been doing what he'd been paid to do. This was being telecast, and Omfrey of Glaspeth and Richard of Didricksburg would both be listening. As of now, they'd start hiring mercenaries. Maybe that would get rid of Dunnan for him. The Duke gave the two-hand sword back to his esquire. The young knight who was carrying the green and tawny shawl handed it to him and Elaine dropped the black and yellow one from her shoulders, the only time a respectable woman ever did that in public, and her mother caught and folded it. He stepped forward and draped the trass colors over her shoulders, and then took her in his arms. The cheering broke out again, and some of Cesar Carval's guardsmen began firing a pom-pom somewhere. It took a little longer than he expected to finish with the toasts and shake hands with those who crowded around. Finally, the exit march started down the long walkway to the landing stage, and the Duke and his party moved away to the rear to prepare for the wedding feast at which everybody but the bride and groom would celebrate. One of the bridesmaids gave Elaine a huge sheaf of flowers, which she was to toss back from the escalator. She held it in the crook of one arm, and clung to his with the other. "'Darling, we really made it,' she was whispering, as though it were too wonderful to believe. Well, wasn't it?" One of the news-cars, orange and blue, that was Westland's telecast and teleprint, had floated just ahead of them and was letting down toward the landing-stage. For a moment he was angry. That went beyond the outer orbit limits of journalistic propriety, even for Westland's T and T. Then he laughed. Today he was too happy for anger about anything. At the foot of the escalator, Elaine kicked off her gilded slippers. There was another pair in the car. He'd seen to that personally, and they stepped onto the escalator and turned about. 
The bridesmaids rushed forward and began struggling for the slippers, to the damage and disarray of their gowns. And when they were halfway up, Elaine heaved the bouquet and it burst apart among them, like a bomb of colored fragrance, and the girls below snatched at the flowers, shrieking deliriously. Elaine stood, blowing kisses to everybody, and he was shaking his clasped hands over his head, until they were at the top. When they turned and stepped off, the orange and blue air car had let down directly in front of them, blocking their way. Now he was really furious, and started forward with a curse. Then he saw who was in the car. Andre Dunnan, his thin face contorted and the narrow mustache writhing on his upper lip. He had a slit beside the window open and was tilting the barrel of a submachine gun up and out of it. He shouted and at the same time tripped Elaine and flung her down. He was throwing himself forward to cover her when there was a blasting multiple report. Something sledged him in the chest. His right leg crumpled under him. He fell. He fell and fell and fell, endlessly, through darkness, out of consciousness. 5. He was crucified and crowned with a crown of thorns. Who had they done that to? Somebody long ago on Terra. His arms were drawn out stiffly and hurt. His feet and legs hurt too, and he couldn't move them. And there was this prickling at his brow. And he was blind. No, his eyes were just closed. He opened them, and there was a white wall in front of him, patterned with a blue snow crystal design. And he realized that it was a ceiling and that he was lying on his back. He couldn't move his head, but by shifting his eyes he saw that he was completely naked and surrounded by a tangle of tubes and wires, which puzzled him briefly. Then he knew that he was not on a bed, but on a robomedic, and the tubes would be for medication and wound drainage and intravenous feeding, and the wires would be to electrodes embedded in his body for diagnosis, and the crown of thorns thing would be more electrodes for encephalograph. He'd been on one of those robomedics before, when he'd been gored by a bisonoid on the cattle range. That was what it was but he was still under treatment. But that seemed so long ago. So many things, he must have dreamed them, seemed to have happened. Then he remembered, and struggled futilely to rise. Elaine, he called. Elaine, where are you? There was a stir, and somebody came into his limited view, his cousin Nikolay Trask. Nikolay, Andre Dunnan, he said. What happened to Elaine? Nikolay winced, as though something he had expected to hurt had hurt worse than he had expected. Lucas, he swallowed. Elaine, Elaine is dead. Elaine is dead. That didn't make sense. She was killed instantly, Lucas. Hit six times. I don't think she even felt the first one. She didn't suffer at all. Somebody moaned, and then he realized that it had been himself. "'You were hit twice,' Nikolay was telling him. "'One in the leg, smashed the femur, and one in the chest. That one missed your heart by an inch.' "'Pity it did,' he was beginning to remember clearly now. "'I threw her down and tried to cover her. I must have thrown her straight into the burst and only caught the last of it myself.' There was something else. Oh, yes. Dunnan! Did they get him? Nikolay shook his head. He got away, stole the Enterprise, and took her off planet. I want to get him myself. He started to rise again. Nikolay nodded to someone out of sight. A cool hand touched his chin, and he smelled a woman's perfume. Nothing at all like Elaine's. Something like a small insect bit him on the neck. The room grew dark. Elaine was dead. There was no more Elaine, nowhere at all. Why, that must mean there was no more world. 
so that was why it had gotten so dark. He woke again, fitfully, and it would be daylight, and he could see the yellow sky through an open window, or it would be night, and the wall lights would be on. There would always be somebody with him. Nicolay's wife, Dame Cecilia, Rovard Grafus, Lady Lavina Carval. He must have slept a long time, for she was much older than he remembered. And her brother, Bert Sandrason. And a woman with dark hair, in a white smock, with a gold caduceus on her breast. Once Duchess Flavia, and once Duke Angus himself. He asked where he was, not much caring. They told him at the Ducal Palace. He wished they'd all go away, and let him go wherever Elaine was. Then it would be dark, and he would be trying to find her, because there was something he wanted desperately to show her. Stars in the sky at night, that was it. But there were no stars, there was no Elaine, there was no anything and he wished that there was no Lucas Trask, either. But there was an Andre Dunnan. He could see him standing, black-cloaked on the terrace, the diamonds in his beret jewel glittering evilly. He could see the mad face peering at him over the rising barrel of the submachine-gun. And then he would hunt for him without finding him, through the cold darkness of space. The waking periods grew longer, and during them his mind was clear. They relieved him of his crown of electronic thorns. The feeding tubes came out, and they gave him cups of broth and fruit juice. He wanted to know why he had been brought to the palace. About the only thing we could do, Rovard Grofus told him. They had too much trouble at Carvel House as it was. You know, Caesar got shot too. No. So that was why Caesar hadn't come to see him. Was he killed? Wounded. He's in worse shape than you are. When the shooting started, he went charging up the escalator. Didn't have anything but his dress dagger. Dunnan gave him a quick burst. I think that was why he didn't have time to finish you off. By that time, the guards who had been shooting blanks from that rapid-fire gun got in a clip of live rounds and fired at him. He got out of there as fast as he could. They have Caesar on a robomedic like yours. He isn't in any danger. The drainage tubes and medication tubes came out. The tangle of wires around him was removed, and the electrodes with them. They bandaged his wounds and dressed him in a loose robe and lifted him from the robomedic to a couch, where he could sit up when he wished. They began giving him solid food and wine to drink and allowed him to smoke. The woman doctor told him he'd had a bad time, as though he didn't know that. He wondered if she expected him to thank her for keeping him alive. "'You'll be up and around in a few weeks,' his cousin added. "'I've seen to it that everything at Trask and Newhouse will be ready for you by then.' "'I'll never enter that house as long as I live, and I wish that wouldn't be more than the next minute.' That was to be Elaine's house. I won't go to it alone." The dreams troubled his sleep less and less as he grew stronger. Visitors came often, bringing amusing little gifts, and he found that he enjoyed their company. He wanted to know what had really happened, and how Dunnan had gotten away. He pirated the Enterprise, Rovard Grofus told him. He had that company of mercenaries of his, and he'd bribed some of the people at Gorham shipyards. I thought Alex would kill his chief of security when he found out what had happened. We can't prove anything. We're trying hard enough to, but we're sure Umfrey of Glaspeth furnished the money. He's been denying it just a shade too emphatically. Then the whole thing was planned in advance. Taking the ship was. He must have been planning that for months, before he started recruiting that company. I think he meant to do it the night before the wedding. Then he tried to persuade the Lady Demoiselle Elaine to elope with him. He seems to have actually thought that was possible. 
and when she humiliated him, he decided to kill both of you first. He turned to Otto Harkeman, who had accompanied him. As long as I live, I'll regret not taking you at your word and accepting your offer then. How did he get hold of that Westland's telecast and teleprint car? Oh, the morning of the wedding, he screened Westland's editorial office and told them he had an inside story on the marriage, and why the Duke was sponsoring it. Made it sound as though there was some scandal. Insisted that a reporter come to Dunnan House for a face-to-face -face interview. They sent a man, and that was the last they saw him alive. Our people found his body at Dunnan House when we were searching the place afterward. We found the car at the shipyard. It had taken a couple of hits from the guns at Carval House, but you know what those press cars are built to stand. He went directly to the shipyard, where his men already had the Enterprise. As soon as he arrived, she lifted out. He stared at the cigarette between his fingers. It was almost short enough to burn him. With an effort, he leaned forward to crush it out. Rovard, how soon will that second ship be finished? Groffus laughed bitterly. Building the Enterprise took everything we had. The Duchy's on the edge of bankruptcy now. We stopped work on the second ship six months ago because we didn't have enough money to keep on with her and still get the Enterprise finished. We were expecting the Enterprise to make enough in the old Federation to finish the second one. Then, with two ships and a base on Teneth, the money would begin coming in instead of going out. But now— It leaves me where I was on Flamberge, Harkeman added. Worse. King Napoleon was going to help the Emersons and I'd have gotten a command in that. It's too late for that now." He picked up his cane and used it to push himself to his feet. The broken leg had mended, but he was still weak. He took a few tottering steps, paused to lean on the cane, and then forced himself to open the window and stood for a moment staring out. Then he turned. "'Captain Harkeman, it might be that you could still get a command here on Graham. That's if you don't mind commanding under me as owner aboard. I'm going hunting for Andre Dunnan." They both looked at him. After a moment, Harkeman said, "'I'd count it an honor, Lord Trask. But where will you get a ship?' "'She's half finished now. You already have a crew for her. Duke Angus can finish her for me and pay for it by pledging his new barony of Traskin. He had known Rovard Groffus all his life. Until this moment, he had never seen Duke Angus henchman show surprise. "'You mean, you'll trade Traskin for that ship?' he demanded. "'Finished, equipped, and ready for space, yes.' "'The Duke will agree to that,' Groffus said promptly. "'But, Lucas, Traskin is all you own.' "'If I have a ship, I won't need them.' I am turning space viking." That brought Harkman to his feet with a roar of approval. Groffus looked at him, his mouth slightly open. "'Lucas Trask, space viking,' he said. "'Now I've heard everything.' Well, why not? He had deplored the effects of viking raiding on the sword worlds, because Graham was a sword world, and Traskin was on Graham and Traskin was to have been the home where he and Elaine would live, and where their children and children's children would be born and live. Now the little point on which all of it had rested was gone. That was another Lucas Trask, Rovard. He's dead now. 6. Groffus excused himself to make a screen call, and then returned to excuse himself again. Evidently, Duke Angus had dropped whatever he was doing as soon as he heard what his henchman had to tell him. Harkeman was silent until after he was out of the room, then said, "'Lord Trask, this is a wonderful thing for me. It's not been pleasant to be a shipless captain living on strangers' bounty. I'd hate, though, to have you think, some time, that I'd advance my own fortunes at the expense of yours.' Don't worry about that. If anybody's being taken advantage of, you are. 
I need a space captain, and your misfortune is my own good luck." Harkeman started to pack tobacco into his pipe. "'Have you ever been off Graham at all?' he asked. "'A few years at the University of Camelot, on Excalibur. Otherwise, no. Well, have you any conception of the sort of thing you're setting yourself to?' The space viking snapped his lighter and puffed. You know, of course, how big the old Federation is. You know the figures, that is, but do they mean anything to you? I know they don't to a good many spacemen, even. We talk glibly about ten to the hundredth power, but emotionally we still count one, two, three, many. A ship in hyperspace logs about a light year an hour. You can go from here to Excalibur in thirty hours but you could send a radio message announcing the birth of a son, and he'd be a father before it was received. The old Federation, where you're going to hunt Dunnan, occupies a space volume of two hundred billion cubic light-years, and you're hunting for one ship and one man in that. How are you going to do it, Lord Trask?" I haven't started thinking about how. All I know is that I have to do it. There are planets in the old Federation where space Vikings come and go, raid and trade bases, like the one Duke Angus planned to establish on Tanith. At one or another of them, I'll pick up word of Dunnan sooner or later. We'll hear where he was a year ago, and by the time we get there, he'll be gone for a year and a half to two years. We've been raiding the old Federation for over three hundred years, Lord Trask. At present, I'd say there are at least two hundred space Viking ships in operation. Why haven't we raided it bare long ago? Well, that's the answer. Distance and voyage time. You know, Dunnan could die of old age, which is not a usual cause of death among space Vikings, before you caught up with him. And your youngest ship's boy could die of old age before he found out about it. Well, I can go hunting for him till I die, then. There's nothing else that means anything to me." I thought it was something like that. I won't be with you all your life. I want a ship of my own, like the Corisandi, that I lost on Durandal. Some day I'll have one. But till you can command your own ship, I'll command her for you. That's a promise." Some note of ceremony seemed indicated. Summoning a robot, he had it pour wine for them, and they pledged each other. Rovard Groffus had recovered his aplomb by the time he returned accompanied by the Duke. If Angus had ever lost his, he gave no indication of it. The effect on everybody else was literally seismic. The general accepted view was that Lord Trask's reason had been unhinged by his tragic loss. There might, he conceded, be more than a crumb of truth in that. At first, his cousin Nicolay raged at him for alienating the barony from the family. And then he learned that Duke Angus was appointing him vicar baron and giving him Trask a new house for his residence. Immediately, he began acting like one at the deathbed of a rich grandmother. The Wardshaven financial and industrial barons, whom he had known only distantly, on the other hand, came flocking around him, offering assistance and hailing him as the savior of the duchy. Duke Angus' credit, almost obliterated by the loss of the enterprise, was firmly re-established, and theirs with it. There were conferences at which lawyers and bankers argued interminably. He attended a few at first, found himself completely uninterested, and told everybody so. All he wanted was a ship, the best ship possible, as soon as possible. Alex Gorham had been the first to be notified. He had commenced work on the unfinished sister ship of the Enterprise immediately. Until he was strong enough to go to the shipyard himself, he watched the work on the two-thousand-foot globular skeleton by screen, and conferred, either in person or by screen, with engineers and shipyard executives. His rooms at the Ducal Palace were converted, almost overnight, from sick rooms to offices. 
The doctors, who had recently been urging him to find new interests and activities, were now warning of the dangers of overexertion. Harkeman finally added his voice to theirs. "'You take it easy, Lucas.' They had dropped formality and were on a first-name basis now. "'You got hulled pretty badly. You let damage control work on you, and don't strain the machinery till it's fixed. We have plenty of time. We're not going to get anywhere chasing Dunnan. The only way we can catch him is by interception. The longer he moves around in the old Federation before he hears we're after him, the more of a trail he'll leave. Once we can establish a predictable pattern, we'll have a chance. Then, sometime, he'll come out of hyperspace somewhere and find us waiting for him." "'Do you think he went to Tanith?' Harkeman heaved himself out of his chair and prowled about the room for a few minutes. Then he came back and sat down again. No. That was Duke Angus' idea, not his. He couldn't put in a base on Tanith anyhow. You know the kind of a crew he has." There had been an extensive inquiry into Dunnan's associates and accomplices. Duke Angus was still hoping for positive proof to implicate Omfrey of Glaspeth in the piracy. Dunnan had with him a dozen and a half employees of the Gorham shipyards, whom he had corrupted. There was some technical ability among them, but for the most part they were agitators and troublemakers, and incompetent workmen. Even under the circumstances, Alex Gorham was glad to see the last of them. As for Dunnan's own mercenary company, there were about a score of former spacemen among them, the rest graded down from bandits, through thugs and sneak thieves, to barroom bums. Dunnan himself was an astrogator, not an engineer. That gang aren't even good enough for routine raiding, Harkeman said. They'd never under any circumstances be able to put a base on Tanith. Unless Dunnan's completely crazy, which I doubt, he's gone to some regular Viking base planet, like Hoth, or Nergal, or Dagon, or Zoxchil, to recruit officers and engineers and able spacemen. All that machinery and robotic equipment and so on that was going to Tanith, was that aboard when he took the ship? Yes, and that's another reason why he'd go to some planet like Hoth or Nergal or Zoxchil. On a Viking-occupied planet in the old Federation, that stuff's almost worth its weight in gold. What's Tanith like? Almost completely Terra-type, third of a Class G sun. Very much like Halteclair or Flamberge. It was one of the last planets the Federation colonized before the Big War. Nobody knows what happened exactly. There wasn't any interstellar war. At least, you don't find any big slag puddles where cities used to be. They probably did a lot of fighting among themselves after they got out of the Federation. There's still some traces of combat damage around. Then they started to de-civilize, down to the pre-mechanical level, wind and water power and animal power. They have draft animals that look like introduced Terran carabaos, and a few small sailboats and big canoes and bateaux on the rivers. They have gunpowder, which seems to be the last thing any people lose. I was there five years ago. I like Tanith for a base. There's one moon, almost solid nickel-iron, and fissionable ore deposits. Then, like a fool, I hired out to the Elmersons on Durendal and lost my ship. When I came here, your duke was thinking about Zipototec. I convinced him that Tanith was a better planet for his purpose. Dunnan might go there at that. He might think he was scoring one on Duke Angus. After all, he has all that equipment. And nobody to use it. If I were Dunnan, I'd go to Nergal or Zakchitl. There are always a couple of thousand space Vikings on either, spending their loot and taking it easy between raids. He could sign on a full crew on either. I suggest we go to Zakchitl first. We might pick up news of him, if nothing else. All right. They'd try Zachittle first. Harkeman knew the planet, 
and was friendly with the Haltaclear noble who ruled it. The work went on at the Gorham shipyard. It had taken a year to build the Enterprise, but the steel mills and engine works were over the preparatory work of tooling up, and material and equipment was flowing in a steady stream. Lucas let him persuade him to take more rest, and day by day grew stronger. Soon he was spending most of his time at the shipyard, watching the engines go in, Abbott lift and drive for normal space, Dillingham hyperdrive, power converters, pseudograv, all at the center of the globular ship. Living quarters and workshops went in next, all armored in collapsium-plated steel. Then the ship lifted out to an orbit a thousand miles off planet, followed by swarms of armored workcraft and cargo lighters. The rest of the work was more easily done in space. At the same time, the four two hundred foot pinnaces that would be carried aboard were being finished. Each of them had its own hyperdrive engines and could travel as far and as fast as the ship herself. Otto Harkeman was beginning to be distressed because the ship still lacked a name. He didn't like having to speak of her as her, or the ship, and there were many things soon to go on that should be name-marked. Elaine, Trask thought at once, and almost at once rejected it. He didn't want her name associated with the things that ship would do in the old Federation. Revenge, Avenger, Retribution, Vendetta. None appealed to him. A news commentator, turgidly eloquent about the nemesis which the criminal Dunnan had invoked against himself, supplied it. Nemesis it was. Now he was studying his new profession of interstellar robbery and murder, against which he had once inveighed. Otto Harkeman's handful of followers became his teachers. Van Larch, guns and missiles, who was also a painter. Guat Kirby, sour and pessimistic, the hyperspatial astrogator who tried to express his science in music. Charles Renner, the normal space astrogator. Alvin Carford, the exec, who had been with Harkeman longest of all. And Sir Patrick Morland, a local recruit, formerly guard captain to Count Lionel of New Haven, who commanded the ground fighters and the combat contragravity. They were using the farms and villages of Traskin for drill and practice, and he noticed that while the Nemesis would carry only five hundred ground and air fighters, over a thousand were being trained. He commented to Rovard Grofus. "'Yes, don't mention it outside,' the Duke's henchman said. "'You and Sir Patrick and Captain Harkeman will pick the five hundred best. The Duke will take the rest into his service.' Some of these days, Omfrey of Glaspeth will find out what a space Viking raid is really like. And Duke Angus would take his new subjects of Glaspeth to redeem the pledges on his new barony of Traskin. Some old pre atomic writer Harkeman was fond of quoting had said, Gold will not always get you good soldiers, but good soldiers can get you gold. The nemesis came back to the Gorham yards and settled onto her curved landing legs like a monstrous spider. The Enterprise had borne the ward, sword, and atom symbol. The nemesis should bear his own badge. But the bisonoid head, tawny on green, of Traskin was no longer his. He chose a skull impaled on an upright sword and it was blazoned on the ship when he and Harkeman took her out for her shakedown cruise. When they landed again at the Gorham Yards, two hundred hours later, they learned that a tramp freighter from Morglay had come into Bigler Sport in their absence with news of Andre Dunnan. Her captain had come to Wardshaven at Duke Angus' urgent invitation, and was waiting for them at the Ducal Palace. They sat, a dozen of them, around a table at the Duke's private apartments. The freighter captain, a small, precise man with a graying beard, alternately puffed at a cigarette and sipped from a beaker of brandy. "'I spaced out from Morglay two hundred hours ago,' he was saying. "'I'd been there twelve local days, 
three hundred galactic standard hours, and the run from Kirtana was three hundred and twenty. This ship, the Enterprise, spaced out from there several days before I did. I'd say she's twelve hundred hours out of Windsor, or Kirtana now." The room was still. The breeze fluttered curtains at the open windows. From the garden below, winged night things twittered. "'I never expected it,' Harkeman said. "'I thought he'd take the ship out to the old Federation at once.' He poured wine for himself. "'Of course, Dunnan's crazy. A crazy man has an advantage sometimes, like a left-handed knife-fighter. He does unexpected things.' "'That wasn't such a crazy move,' Rovard Groffis said. "'We have very little direct trade with Kirtana. It's only an accident we heard about this when we did.' The freighter captain's beaker was half empty. He filled it to the brim from the decanter. "'She was the first Gram ship there for years,' he agreed. "'That attracted notice, of course. And his having the blazonry changed, from the sword and atom symbol to the blue crescent, and the ill feeling on the part of other captains and planet-side employers about the men he lured away from them. How many men, and what kind? The man with the gray beard shrugged. I was too busy getting a cargo together for Morglay to pay much attention. Almost a full spaceship complement, officers and spacemen of every kind and a lot of industrial engineers and technicians. Then he is going to use that equipment that was aboard, and put in a base somewhere, somebody said. If he left Kirtana twelve hundred hours ago, he's still in hyperspace, Guat Kirby said. It's over two thousand from Kirtana to the nearest old Federation planet. How far to Tanith? Duke Angus asked. I'm sure that's where he's gone. He'd expect me to finish the other ship and equip her like the Enterprise and send her out. He'd want to get there first. I'd thought that Tanith would be the last place he'd go, Harkeman said. But this changes the whole outlook. He could have gone to Tanith. He's crazy, and you're trying to apply sane logic to him, Guat Kirby said. You're figuring what you'd do and you aren't crazy. Of course, I've had my doubts at times, but—' "'Yes, he's crazy, and Captain Harkeman's allowing for that,' Rovard Groffus said. "'Dunnan hates all of us. He hates his grace here. He hates Lord Lucas and Cesar Carval. Of course, he may think he killed both of them. He hates Captain Harkeman. So how could he score all of us off at once? By taking Tanith. You say he was buying supplies and ammunition? That's right. Gun ammunition, ship's missiles, and a lot of ground defense missiles. What was he buying them with? Trading machinery? No, gold. Yes, Lothar Fail found out that a lot of gold was transferred to Dunnan from banks in Glaspeth and Didricksburg, Groffus said. He got that aboard when he took the ship, evidently. All right, Trask said. We can't be sure of anything, but we have some reasons for thinking he went to Tanith, and that's more than we have for any other planet in the old Federation. I won't try to estimate the odds against our finding him there, but they're a good deal bigger anywhere else. We'll go there first. End of chapter 6